No. So thank you for coming. Hi. Hi. We waited just a little bit to start because the parking is especially far away. I'm sure it's kind of surprise me. I know. But thank you. Uh, so my name is Rachel Geyser. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters Roseville Area Program Committee. Before we start tonight, I just want everyone to be aware of the fact that we are recording this and we will be posting it to our YouTube channel. So just to make sure that you know that that's happening. So the League of Women Voters is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. It is open to both men and women, and our mission is to encourage informed and active participation in government and influence public policy through education and advocacy. I would like to let you know about some upcoming League events. On Tuesday, September 4th at 7 p.m. at the Shoreview Library, our League will co-host for the Shoreview Library the first in a series of six presentations and discussions on the topic of Becoming American, a series on the immigration experience. Each presentation begins with a film followed by discussion. The first evening will be the refu refugee journey in 2018, the transition from life in a refugee camp to being resettled in America. On Monday, September 13th from 7 to 8.30, our league will co-host with the new Brighton League, Fixing the Hole in Our Democracy, DC Statehood, an attempt at getting con congressional representation for the residents of DC. A member of the DC League of Women Voters will be a featured speaker at the New Brighton Community Center. And on Tuesday, September 25th, from 6.30 to 8, at the Roseville Library, Secretary of State Steve Simon will discuss the security of Minnesota's election system, making your voice count. This is co-hosted with the Roseville Library and Do Good Roseville. So all of these events are free and they're open to the public. Now for tonight's program. It's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Sarah Walker, founder of the Minnesota Second Chance Coalition. Sarah is a graduate of Carleton College and is currently completing her doctorate in the Department of Sociology at the University of Minnesota. Among her many accomplishments is service as research, research consultant at the Council on Crime and Justice, Director of Workforce Development at the Center for Court Innovation, Executive Director of the Youth Justice Funding Collaborative, and Interim Research Director of the Council on Crime and Justice. Sarah has also served as a board member of the William Mitchell Reentry Clinic Advisory Board, St. Paul African American Leadership Council, and, the, and Twin Cities Rise, and as an appointment of Governor Dayton to the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Please welcome Sarah Walker. Soft on crime, and there was really no middle road. 
And so I was sitting in class one day, it was a history class, an African American history class, and there is a famous um, African American sociologist named Orlando Patterson at the University of Chicago. And he was, he had written an article, um, a sort of seminal article, making an argument about slavery, saying that one of the problems when we discuss slavery in a historical context is that we don't have an operational definition of what we consider slavery and what we don't. So what he did was he offered three things that he said were required if you were going to call something slavery. And those three things were, the first one was natal alienation, so meaning that in some way or form you're denied connections to your family um, and making those connections mother, daughter, father, daughter, or your family's ripped apart. The other one, um, the other one was general dishonorment, meaning you're not honored by your society. And then the last one was um, violent subordination, meaning that you undergo daily acts of violence and it's a sort of constant, ever-present in your life. And so I wrote a paper that said that it was an inadequate definition of slavery because it would encompass the modern day prison population. And honestly, from that point on, I never really looked back and I knew that this was what I wanted to do. So after I did that, and at this point I was doing my like undergraduate thesis and I was in political science and they told me that it was not a political issue. They said that criminal justice is the purview of sociology and not politics. And that it really was an issue, you know, of criminology, very specifically. It was like corrections and it, it wasn't politically relevant. And so I literally couldn't find anyone to work with me on the issues. So then I ended up going to New York where I became a director of workforce development at the Center for Port Innovation. And at the Center for Port Innovation, they are the first um, sort of big entity that started the drug court and treatment court, specialty courts, like now we have veterans courts, and they started that. And so I worked there and it was right when we had gone through the welfare to work initiative under Clinton. And under Clinton, the Department of Labor and Human Resources Administration had set aside a large amount of money to help people get back into work. And the populations that they wanted were um, long-term public assistance recipients, non-custodial fathers, and, um, and people with criminal records. Well, you would be, not very shockingly, that group has a huge amount of overlap. And so I worked in New York City setting up the first re-entry programs for people coming out of um, prison. And in New York, they have like a <coughs> special prison that people come for the last six months to begin the reintegration process. So I worked inside and outside the prisons trying to set up these programs. And then from there, I took a job as the executive director of the Youth Justice Funding Collaborative. <coughs> and that was a national group that had come together, a bunch of philanthropists who said they wanted to address the racial disparities in juvenile justice. And, and at this point, we still had some, the juvenile death penalty. And so we did a lot of convenings about that and um, funded a lot of organizations to help address those issues, but ultimately we did in fact uh, win at the Supreme Court and we eliminated the juvenile death penalty in the United States. But at the time, we were one of the only, we were the only Western democracy that still put juveniles to death that had them on death row. Well, what year was that? God, it must have been. Definitely. I know, I should know this from my head, but it's, uh, I think it was 2004 or three. Yes. But so, I mean, it's amazing that in this time period that we were still having people on death row. So then from there I went to Louisiana, where my brother is from, and um, I was there before I went to grad school, and there was a notorious prison there called the Tulula Prison, and that prison had had the most juvenile deaths by the hands of guards and lots of sexual abuse, and so I helped run a campaign to end, to close down that prison, and then close down. I came to graduate school here, and then I had this really unusual experience, um, which is how I ended up founding the Second Chance Coalition, is that I was doing my research and I honestly thought that that time that I just wanted to write books about this and sit in the ivory tower and do, uh, do research, because no one might believe this now, but I'm actually do not normally, I never thought I wanted to do any public speaking or any presenting <laughs> in my life. It was, if you asked me, that was the one thing I did not want to do. But I end up in, um, back in New Orleans because my mother gets diagnosed with cancer and so I move her from our family home to New Orleans so she could be with my brother and I. And it happens that I moved her three weeks before Hurricane Katrina. 
So I end up in Hurricane Katrina with my mother, and in that experience, a few things happened to me. We fortunately did eventually get out, and my mom, my mom died a few weeks later, but she, but what I saw was just an unbelievable devastation. And so when I came back to graduate school, I felt this overwhelming need to do something tangible. I just felt this huge responsibility because the thing that was seared into my mind is, as I was, you know, moving my mother to one of those hospitals, I was telling the people in the community, mostly African American and poor, you should go to the convention center. And we all know that was probably not the best advice, but just seeing the devastating disparities, I just felt like I had to do something different. So I took, while I was in graduate school, I took um, a job at the Council on Crime and Justice doing consulting and working on racial disparity report. They did a big racial disparity report. And while I was there, I came up with this idea that, as you know, Minnesota has like the highest level of civic participation of any state in the nation. And we should all be very proud of that. And if you go to the Capitol, which I bet everyone in here, here has been to the Capitol to advocate for something at some point, <laughs> is that there was, you know, literally on any given day, there was at least one to five days on the hills. And, but the one thing that no one was ever talking about was the impact of the criminal justice system on people's lives. So I pulled together a very small group at the time of people, nonprofits who worked in this area, and I think there was probably seven at the time. Some of you know Goodwill Industries, RS Eden, um, and we decided we were going to try to do our own day on the hill. And we, I was a little worried because I thought there was a lot of ways this could go wrong, and we wanted people who had criminal records and people who had, who had been impacted by it in some tangential way, so their families, their friends. And we ended up having about 800 people show up that day. But of course, I, I honestly, again, I also did not need to become like a full-time political consultant. So at this point, you know, we were a little bit naive and we just thought, well, that would make a difference. But no, we needed a policy agenda and we needed to understand better the workings of the legislature. But what it said, it was, it was I heard from many legislators, there was also the, mo the most people of color they'd ever seen at the Capitol at one time. And the impact on the individuals who came with criminal records was probably the most remarkable because a lot of them said like they just didn't feel like this was a place they could go or would be welcome. And we usually have people from law enforcement speak, so a diverse group. But obviously at that first day on the Hill, we did have some law enforcement speak, but we, we couldn't get any legislators to come. Democrat or Republican. But because of the we were so successful in a big turnout the following year, we had tons of legislators, and now legislators are like, when is the day on the hill? Can we come and speak at it? But I, so I just say this to say that the criminal justice reform movement has been a long evolution. We hear about it a lot now, but it took many, many years and many different organizations working on this for a really long period of time. And so, you know, ultimately, what continues to drive me to do this work and why I think it's, I still would argue it's probably one of the, the most important social problem facing America. And the reason is, is because for too many years, what we have done to the criminal justice system is say that the criminal justice system can be the place of last resort. It's where we send everyone when our other institutions fail. So when our systems of education fail, when our systems of mental health fail, when our systems of housing are inadequate, all of those, we've been able to sort of not have to address some of those failures because we have this criminal justice um, as, as basically a backdoor out for a lot of these issues. And I don't think we will ever fully address some of those unless we stop the flow of people into the prison system. So um, I'm going to now go a little bit more into um, the formal presentation. And I suspect a lot of you know some of the basic information. But as we all know, the United States incarceration rate is the eighth highest, it's, uh, eight times the world's average. There is no other country that even comes close, except maybe Russia and China, but their numbers aren't very accurate. The other thing we know is like you can go to places like Norway or Switzerland or Amsterdam and a lot of it, they have a totally different philosophy towards prisons. It's open, it's very rehabilitative, very few people in prison. So the United States has been down this path which really started in the 1970s after the civil rights movement. There was kind of a backlash and under Nixon, this was when the sort of mass incarceration period started. But unfortunately, it has continued until this last, these last few years. Um, and one in every 31 adults is in the correctional system, and in Minnesota it's one in 26, 
which is up uh, from one in 1988 in 1982. So a few things about Minnesota specifically. Historically, we've always been seen in the correctional, criminal justice world as sort of like the uh, idealized island that's doing really well. But unfortunately, um, in the last two decades, we have kind of slipped back. We do have one of the smallest prison populations in the country. And so on some levels, we're doing that right, except that right now we have the fastest growing prison population in the country. And some of that's because a lot of states like Texas or California, for example, they really went kind of hog wild with over incarceration and are now working on reform. So they're, and they also have a bigger population. But so we have about 10,000 people in prison on any given day, but we're facing a massive uh, prison bed shortage at the moment. And so there's been a big debate at the Capitol about whether or not we contract with a private prison or do we build a new prison. And it's a very difficult situation. I mean, my response is we need to find ways to put fewer people in prison. But, I, and I would say that focusing on we should not build a new prison, we should not use private, but the problem is there are actually inmates suffering in the meantime because when the prisons are overcrowded, they, they, don't, they end up going to local county jails. And local county jails don't have rehabilitation programs. They generally don't have work programs for people. So it means you're less likely to be successful when you get out. They often don't have drug treatment programs. So we have been doing a lot of work to correct some of this, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but the other thing that's unique and troubling about Minnesota is Minnesota has the eighth highest rate of people under correctional control in the nation. And that's a 278% increase since 1982. And so part of that reason is, while we don't put a lot of people in prison, we have the most draconian probation policies in the nation. In fact, we're one of, I think, four states who doesn't have what we would call a probation cap, which says like you can't put anyone on probation for more than five years. And so we have people in Minnesota for nonviolent offenses who are have 20, 30, sometimes even 40 year probation sentences. And this is a problem, and I think that, I would honestly say again, I don't think some of this was like a conscious um, malintent by anyone. I think the idea was we're not putting people in prison, so we're going to give them longer probation sentences. But what every bit of research on um, recidivism and effectiveness and corrections, all the evidence-based research shows that actually after three years, basically probation is either, you've either failed or you haven't, and after five years, you actually get diminishing results. And so one, I would say it's not cost effective for us because we have probation officers who can't really do their job of checking on people because they have such high caseloads. But number two, there are so many barriers already with, associated with the criminal record, but there's also a lot of barriers that you can't address until you're off probation. So we passed a bunch of remedies, but most of them can't even, you can't even start them until you're off probation. But the other thing is, I just think from a, when you think about, we've obviously, there's been a lot of tension within communities with um, some of the police shootings, but a lot of that tension to me grows out of the fact that there are specific communities that have been under surveillance for exceedingly long times. So if you can imagine growing up in a community where it's normal every day to see a probationer officer come in and out of your life, like that has an impact on you and how you view institutions and how you see the world. Um, how you feel about the criminal justice system. But, so this is um, one of the biggest problems we need to address in Minnesota. And then, this is a, the best graph, but it, it's really just supposed to highlight that a lot of people, I think any, I think initially when I used to talk about criminal justice before, people would say, well, you know, you're going to like be helping murderers. And I mean, well, the answer is, well, yes, I would. But the reality is, is that that is a very small portion of who is actually under correctional supervision. The vast majority, this huge rise in people who are coming in and out of our correction system isn't coming from violent offenses. It's mostly coming from drug crimes and property crimes. And the other thing I'll just note, which isn't in this graph, is that um, Minnesota is generally first or second to last in this country, um, depending on the year, on racial disparities. So, and there's, I will say some more about that because there's some interesting factors to that, which is part of that problem is, so the racial disparities then compound all of this and make it seem this way. But even though we have these really bad racial disparities, this, still the vast majority of people under correctional supervision actually are, okay. Yeah, um, I can't read the um, 
Could you tell us what Yeah, so this one is just, these are the person crimes. Um, it only goes to 2008. These are property, drugs, and others. So the vast majority of these are the nonviolent crimes, and that's really the bulk of the people who are, people who have person crimes and serious crimes, they're going to spend a long time in prison, no matter what, and they'll get out and they have a very strict policy to follow. But really what we're doing is incarcerating people for drug offenses. And with the opioid crisis, for the first time ever, our racial disparities actually went down, not because we were doing anything positive, but because more Caucasian people were actually being incarcerated. And if you ask me, that's not how I want to solve the racial disparity. <laughs> so, um, but the other impact that I think people often forget about is that there's more than two million, and this is literally the most conservative number. Some of the numbers have it up to 20 million, and I think go why. There's a lot of, Many fathers who go into the prison system don't actually note on there how many children they have and what their status is. But the reality is, is children and families are impacted. And I would say not just children and families, but entire communities. Because for example, I'll use, um, there's been some really great research out of Chicago in a neighborhood right side, outside of Chicago called North Lawndale. And what that showed was on any given day, 50% of the African American men in that community are cycling in it at some point in the criminal justice system. Well, you can't not only have a stable family, but you, it means you're, there's not a stable workforce, but you can't have a stable community with that kind of transition. So it has these really long term impacts. And all of the research now that's been done in the last five years about the impact of having an incarcerated parent has shown that it's basically the equivalent of, it can either be a parental death or a very um, hostile divorce. And that, so you create a trauma with the child that can last them forever. And that no matter, and what we also know about um, parenting is that no matter what the parent has done, the child still wants a connection with them. And so there are going to be ripple effects within communities for an extremely long time. And then my favorite issue um, is that, uh, and this is an issue that the League of Women Voters adopted, I think, two or three years ago. So one in five African American men can't vote because they're incarcerated or on probation and parole. So in Minnesota, I think this year, about 65,000 people won't be able to vote because they're on probation, parole, or, or incarcerated. Um, and the vast majority of those are actually people on probation and parole. And what I would say is if we think people are safe enough to live in the community, to work and pay taxes, they should be safe enough to vote. And I think the interesting thing about this is um, we've come a long way on this issue and there's a lot of bipartisan support for it now. But when you go back to Minnesota's Constitution, what the Constitution actually says is that people you are not allowed to vote if they're um, incarcerated or if they're serving time. But there's enabling language that then defines what that means. And so in Minnesota right now, it includes probation and parole. But so we can do a statutory change and, and make it so at least the people who are living in the community are able to vote. And so it's actually been an argument that I think has been compelling to a much broader um, group than just like progressive liberals because um, many of the conservative Republicans really believe in constitutional purity and constitutional intent. And when you talk about constitutional intent in voting, at the time where our Constitution was written, there was not even a, there was no even concept of a probation system. Probation, the first time probation was ever um, initiated anywhere was actually in Chicago, and it was around 1910. And it really didn't take off in Minnesota until the 40s or 50s. So when the founders were writing that, no one had any concept that we would, one, have this mass incarceration problem, but two, also have this whole system in which people were living in the community and paying taxes and not being able to vote. And I tell people, like, they are your neighbors. And a lot of people might not tell you because it can be embarrassing. But it also creates a ton of confusion. And one of my, my, my long-term concerns and um, something that I frequently talk with Secretary Sykes Simon on is if we want to continue to be a, or a group, I mean, a, a state that has the highest voter participation, one of the things you have to be conscious of and know is that voting and participation and civic engagement, it's a learned behavior. It's something that you have to pass on. I know for me, the first time I ever went to a ballot box was with my mother, and that's where you sort of get these experiences ingrained in you. But because there are these huge disparities as well, and I would also say that 
there's, it's not just racial disparities, there are income disparities. But so if you go into North Minneapolis and one in five people can't vote, it means one in five people are not passing that on to their, their children. They're not saying that this is an important value. And that will be a lingering effect that we will have for a long time. The other thing is I was saying is that while we have the biggest disparities, racial disparities in, um, in the country, because Minnesota has only about 5% African American population, the end result is still, again, as I said, the majority of people actually who would get their rights restored are outside of Hennepin and Ramsey County and are overwhelmingly Caucasian. And with the opioid crisis, it's increasingly becoming that way. And so I also hear concerns about voting, well, because there's a lot of, I think, stereotypes and assumptions made when we talk about who's going to vote and voting behavior is that African Americans overwhelmingly vote Democratic. Well, and that is still true, but the reality is, is outside of Hennepin and Ramsey, um, what, what little research we've shown is that the county breakdown is actually almost identical in terms of the percentage of people who have their votes restored. So you're not going to be swinging House districts or Senate districts. The other thing I fundamentally believe is that people still vote their district. You're still, um, you're still influenced by the, your surroundings and your group and some of the high profile cases that have come to newspapers about individuals who were caught and <coughs> didn't understand that they couldn't vote actually all said they voted Republican so far. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, you know, and then, and then a new avenue we're exploring in this is that, um, and my husband's a criminal defense attorney, and he recently represented someone who it was a veteran who thought that he could vote, and what happened was he was told he was getting off probation early in September. He signed the paperwork. Apparent, he, then in November, he went to go vote, and they had not turned in the paperwork. So then he was charged with a, a felony, and that got worked out. But I mean, the other thing is, is one of the most, uh, the fastest growing populations in our criminal justice system is actually veterans. And so there's a lot of work being done on how do we deal with that. But if there's one group that I would say should never lose their right to vote, some of these people are like multiple tour combat vets who have been defending our country for a long time. And I think it's just too sacred to um, make that. But so that's um, that's been one of the driving forces of the the Second Chance Coalition. And then in addition, increasingly, uh, one in five people in America have some form of criminal record. And when I say that, it doesn't include just an arrest record. But why that's relevant is because um, nowadays you can just log, you can just go to the Minnesota State Courts records and you can see every arrest of anyone. Does that include misdemeanors? It does include misdemeanors. I can literally go on to the Minnesota State Court right, yeah, Minnesota, and with no, I mean, this is just public access and I can find out with parking tickets. And so, the, and, well, and let alone, that's like a very easy way to do it. Not every state, it's quite that easy, but you can also pay $5 and get anyone's criminal background check. So the problem is, is that when we were passing all these laws and leading towards mass incarceration, we did not anticipate whatsoever that we would have this level of technological access to criminal records. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was a lot of unintended consequences because 20 years ago, you would literally have to go down to the county in which someone create, like, committed a crime and pull that record and ask them for it. Well, so that didn't happen very often. But now, um, now it's very easy and accessible, and it prevents you from getting jobs. It hurts your credit. And so what it does is it compounds whatever, whether it's an income inequality, a racial inequality, and then it also, I think, sets people down a path of um, lower wages, harder to employ, and it's a chronic crisis that we have. So um, this has been an increasingly difficult challenge, and it has also brought together a lot of people you wouldn't suspect. And so as I said, uh, first we organized the first Second Chance Stay on the Hill in 2008, and it was great. And this is the second year when there, there is uh, Senator Linda Higgins. She was and Senator Bean if you guys remember them. They were early supporters. But the other thing I just want to say is that literally, at first, it was really hard to get even Democrats to support it because they were so scared that they would get unelected for being soft on crime. And obviously, it's easier if you're in a safe district. But it took a lot of work and a lot of time and education and a lot of advocacy and turning people out, um, both for elections and caucuses.
caucuses, but it was a process that grew. And so eventually we grew over to, to over 50 organizations. I think right now we're at like 65 organizations. And um, we get a lot, we get support from even institutional correctional organizations now. Um, and this is just an example of some of them. Very diverse, and we try to really be true to the statewide. We've always tried to remain, I would say, radically nonpartisan. I mean, obviously, people, it's no secret what my political affiliation is, but on these issues, one of the most satisfying things is that it's one of the few areas in the country where there's actually some bipartisan support for it. So almost every bill we passed has been, no, every bill we passed has been bipartisan, and a few have even passed unanimously. But so when we, after this, we were trying, we came up with a bunch of principles that we would want to use to make sure that we were guided in the right direction. And the other, and the other thing that we did, which I met the league, having worked with you guys on other issues, we'll know is that coalition building is really hard work and it's hard to keep people at the table. And one of the issues is, is amongst nonprofits, there's often a lot of competition. Who's going to get credit? Is someone going to get money from this? <laughs> And so we actually made a decision that we were not going to take any money, and we were also not going to advocate for anything that was money related. Because many of the nonprofits who um, were there are also going to the legislature asking for money. But I would say there was one exception, and it was when they were going to defund the GMAC program because we thought it universally benefited the people impacted. But we see we don't ask for money, we work on policy solutions. Um, but basically, we want to ensure that everyone is treated fairly, regardless of means and background in the criminal justice system. Um, and then we also wanted to maximize the ability of returning citizens to access employment, housing, education, and to become fully contributing members of our society. The reality is, is, is 98% of people in Minnesota are going to come out of prison. And so we have a choice. Do we want them to come out prepared for freedom and prepared for the workforce? and help them do that, or do we want to limit those opportunities? Right now, Minnesota has one of the highest recidivism rates in the country. And, but I will say this, so there's, there's two things about that. One is, it's, there's a few reasons, but one is that we, we do tend to have fewer people in prison, so the people who come out have, I would say, more compounded barriers. But the other issue is, is that, I'll give an example, I used to run um, Community Corrections Association, uh, 180 degrees for eight years, and we dealt with all the serious violent offenders coming out. So when you come to a halfway house in Minnesota, you're given 30 days to find a job, and then 60 day, another 30 days to find housing. If I lost my job today, I don't know that I could find a job in 30 days. And then you're talking about someone who may have been incarcerated for a while, doesn't have necessarily a huge family support system, very limited means to transportation, and then it's facing the barrier of a criminal record. So a lot of people go back because of failure to find housing or jobs, but there's really limited opportunities for some of these individuals. So one of our main focuses has been on expanding opportunities for housing and um, employment. And then as I said before, one in five people have some form of a criminal record now. Um, and then a lot of this, a lot of these barriers and this probably mass incarceration is because when people come out these barriers, we create a cyclical cycle where people are transitioning in and out of the system. The other reason is, is that a lot of people commit technical violations, which means that you might be on probation and one of your rules might be you have to have a job or you can't um, smoke pot. But they're not necessarily committing, most of them aren't committing new crimes. They're actually committing technical violations. And that actually counts for one third of our prison population right now. Claire, you're late. No, I'm not. No. there's huge areas where you're just permanently not able to work in. 
And a lot of them are areas where one, we need we need people to work. So like you couldn't be a PCA, anything that requires a licensing. Basically, so anything in human services, it is extremely difficult. And there's a process where you can go and apply for a waiver. Um, but one, it takes a lot of work, and oftentimes companies don't want to wait for that process to play out. And then if you have to appeal it, it's like another few months. But the other issue is, even when you, I have a lot of friends in my life who have successfully appealed and been able to work at an organization who was kind enough to hold the job while they went through this process. But let's say you want to get a promotion. You have to go through another one of these processes. Or if you want, you get a better job opportunity at another organization that requires some form of human service licensing. You, that company basically has to say, well, you have to reapply for this whole process. So there are all these statutory barriers that are limiting people. But I would say this, but one of the biggest needs we have, and we've we heard a lot about this in the last two years, is the need for people to help in nursing home and healthcare. We do not have enough people to do those jobs. And I'm not saying you, you don't necessarily want someone who has a history, you don't want someone who's history of you know, abusing someone to be working on those facilities, but if you're a kid who made a mistake 10 years ago and is now well recovered from a drug addiction, like I feel like you should be able to move on with your life and have that opportunity. And the other thing is, is when we started this, there was very few remedies for people to address this. Um, then, we also, all one of our other goals is to ensure that juvenile offenders are not limited in their ability to become successful adults. And to me, one of the most stark and most disturbing um, pieces of research I've seen is that in 1980, 14% of African American young men who didn't graduate from high school went on to prison. Today, that number is 40%. And it actually accounts for the entire growth in the prison population since 1980, when you take the national view. And so the problem is, we know if you can't get through high school, we basically know what track you're headed on. And so, and when I, and I think earlier I said that one of the reasons I was so passionate about this is because I felt like unless we kept on saying this was a place of last resort that was unacceptable, we wouldn't address those failures. So, so many of our young uh, men who are struggling, particularly African American men, are just really feeding into this pipeline of prison system. So yes, we need to do something about the education, um, system and how and how that handles this, but we need to keep young men in in school. Number one. But and the other thing is, and so like for a long time we changed some of these, and I'll talk about some of the changes we've made that are because this sounds very negative. But um, juveniles, I know when I was 18, I was always under this impression that anything I did before I was 18 would be like I get a clean slate. Well, unfortunately, it's very different, and it goes state by state. But when I first moved to Minnesota, that was absolutely not the case. Basically, if you were 16, 17, and you were charged with a felony, even if it was dismissed and you were found not guilty, that stayed on your criminal record forever. And I remember very clearly getting a call from a mother in Duluth who said her son was 17, and he snuck out of the house, took the car. She was like, well, she thought she was being responsible, which, I mean, she was. And she called the police to let them know that he had taken her car. Well, they charged him with um, felony car theft. He ended up getting reduced to some sort of like petty misdemeanor and had like a short period on probation, went off to college, wanted to do a field, finished college, but chose a field that required a human service licensing. So he gets back to Minnesota and now can't work in the field that he's educated in. And so she literally called in tears, saying, like, this is totally unjust. I feel like I've ruined my child's life. But I do think, especially with kids, we need to acknowledge that people make mistakes. If I got caught for everything I did when I was under <laughs> I would not be standing here. So, and then the other thing is, and I know some of these are more controversial, but one of the other big issues driving our juvenile population has actually been kids who are put in out-of-home placement in foster care group homes. And a lot of these kids are coming from traumatic backgrounds, and so they don't always have the best barriers, but they end up in some sort of consensual sexual relationship with someone who's similar in their age, and then they get charged with now a sex crime. And that's a very controversial issue to deal with, but what we know about the foster, the biggest predictors of future prison are whether or not you graduated from high school, but also if you had any contact with the foster care system, that is actually the number one, that is the number one indicator, and then it's third grade reading level. So that is literally how corrections departments 
look at projected prison populations is by looking at third grade reading levels. So, and then the last one is uh, fully diagnosed and treatmental illness. So one, we shouldn't be criminalizing people who are mentally ill. Um, and the other thing we know is that chemical addiction, um, over 80% of the people in Minnesota's prison population either had some form of substance abuse or were high while they committed their crimes. So we know that a lot of this problem could be addressed if we dealt with it in the community through treatment programs. But the other thing we know is that um, there are only 30% of the people who need treatment in the Minnesota's prisons actually have access to it because there hasn't been enough, we haven't well funded those programs. But the thing that doesn't make sense to me, if we know someone has a chemical addiction or a persistent mental health challenge, if we're not gonna treat them and we put them back out in the community eventually with any, without any treatment, it seems crazy to think that we're gonna get a different result. So I frequently say about the prison system is there's nowhere where we would accept, where we would, where there's this much failure, where we would accept it for this long period of time. Yeah, is there any research on the alcohol effects? There is some research. I don't know it quite as well, but I will say it also is more persistent in certain populations. It's probably one of the largest uh, drivers within the Native American community. Yeah, when you're incarcerated, how many people are being treated for that later? Yes, and I mean, that's the problem. There aren't really great services. I mean, I will say our Commission of Corrections has been advocating for the last few years to get more resources for that. But the other thing is when you get out of prison, so even if you have a severe persistent mental illness or you have a chemical dependency program, you need that you need that support when you're first getting out because that's when you're most likely to reinvent is when you're first six months. And so you need to have some <coughs> continuity of care, but because the way the federal government, um, so when you're in prison, you don't have access to any federal program, so we have to eat the cost of all the health care and mental health treatment. So you basically get, you, when you leave prison, you get three days worth of your medication. So in those three days, you have to go find a place to prescribe your medication, which means we overuse like our county facilities, but so it's a very hard cycle to break. Um, and 60% of people in Minnesota's jails um, report symptoms of mental illness. I can say at the halfway house that I used to run that 90%, um, and this was, this was a, uh, probably the most uh, severe offender population, but over 70% had some form of not just mental illness, but I would say severe mental illness that required psychotropic medication. So, and 70 to 80% of all incarcerated individuals have a drug or alcohol problem. And then we just want to limit the adverse impact of criminal justice on children and families because again, as I said, we are creating a pattern and a, we were gonna create a cycle. But even when a parent is removed from the home, that is, even if they were making informal income, that is still income that's been taken away from that child. It's also a parental loss. And so, I, um, so now I'm just going to talk to you about a little bit about some of the stuff we have done successfully to address these issues. So the first big thing that happened with the Second Chance Coalition is we were very concerned about employment and um, basically if you can't work, you can't support yourself or your family and stop the cycle of incarceration and pushes you into the informal workplace or you know, back to dealing drugs. So the Second Chance Coalition became the with our advocacy, we became the first state to ban the box. First, in 2009, we passed the first ever statewide ban the box for government, for anyone in government. And we did that intentionally because we had a lot of pushback from some of the business communities. Um, so then the next year, we were able to actually move that. Go ahead. Could you tell me the ban the box? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm speaking shorthand. So um, ban the box requires, is when we say, basically what happened is you pass a law that said you could not ask about a criminal record on an initial appointment out. Because what was happening is, in this, it used to, a lot of them would say, have you ever been arrested or convicted of anything? So this means even if you had a marijuana arrest at 18, you were having to check that as yes. And quite frankly, they were getting thrown in the trash. And we think that if you have an opportunity to explain yourself, especially if it's a lower level crime, you have a better opportunity of getting a job. And it also, so then we eventually moved that, and so we became the first state ever to require a statewide private sector in the box. So now no company in Minnesota is allowed to ask on the initial employment application about arrest or conviction. It doesn't mean you can't ask later in the process. You can't ask at some point. Obviously there's some individuals we don't want, you know, you don't want someone who's been in a sex offense working with children. There are very common sense responses. 
But I don't think we want someone who had a drug charge to not be able to work at McDonald's. I don't think that was the intention. So we've done that. And the really good thing that I'd say the unintended consequence about that that has come out of this is that a lot of employers have now had to reevaluate how they do HR processes and have like come up with their own best practices about working with and considering people with criminal records. And we actually, before we were able to do it at the state level, we actually passed it first in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and so they did it. And now it's passed in, I'd say, countless states across the country. But the other thing we did, I mentioned that case um, where the mother called me about wanting her kid had stolen her car, and now he wasn't able to get licensed. So we did actually also change the law that made it so it requires that at a conviction of a felony level, otherwise your record is, is clear now in Minnesota. Because there were just too many youth who had made mistakes, didn't realize that it was based on the charge, and so we were able to change that law. But the other thing related to that is, it wasn't just this kid. There are many people who go to programs, I mean, including law enforcement programs, nursing programs, who don't realize that something in their past is gonna hurt them. But now they've now taken out loans to pay for their education. So we also passed the Minnesota Higher Education Notification Law, which requires schools um, and programs that might require licensing at the end where criminal record could be taken into consideration that they at least notify that students so that they are at least informed about these potential barriers before they take out massive student loans. So we did that. Um, then we did, we passed the, what I would say is considered now the most comprehensive expungement law in the country. So in that law, basically what it does, we were saying there's limited remedies if you ever have a criminal record. So what that does is it allows individuals who have criminal records and have demonstrated that they are rehabilitated to appeal to the court to have their records um, wiped out. And so we did that and now it's being copied around the country and is viewed as a model expungement law, although I would still like to go a little bit farther with it. And when I said before that we have this huge probation population, so part of the problem with our probation population is so even to apply for an expungement, you have to be on probation depending on the level of your crime for a certain period of time. So if you're on probation for 20 years, it doesn't really help you very much to have an expungement law if you have to wait 20 years to apply. And so even if it's just a three year waiting period post probation, it's still just a long time because you still have to find a job and work and support yourself. Um, and then two years ago, we ended up passing the most comprehensive drug sentencing reform law. And again, I don't think it went far enough, but um, we spent, I would say, one entire session in negotiations with law enforcement and um, another of um, many partners um, and came up with a law that basically reduced time served for people with nonviolent drug offenses. And this was important because there were quite a few cases in Minnesota where someone who had actually committed a manslaughter or murder were serving less time than someone for a nonviolent drug offense. Um, we do not put, I just want to be clear, we do not put people in prison in Minnesota for marijuana unless they were dealing, like you literally have to have a truckload of marijuana to be in prison. So we don't, that just isn't a Minnesota thing. So we don't do that, but the reality is, is that, so that is, has been helping us um, also reduce our overall prison population. And with, with, when, when we passed that, we also put something in the language that said, from the savings from the corrections department, we want that money to go back into the community. So we created a justment, justice reinvestment fund. So now grants are made to the communities based on the savings from the corrections department so that we can work on some of the reentry problems that we have with helping people get jobs and housing, um, but also on the front end so we can do diversion programs. And so, but the other thing I wanna say about this effort is, I mentioned a few times now that when I first started this, I was literally laughed out. I was laughed out in many classes early on, and I think people thought it was kind of like a cute project I was working on. But since this time, we have, the landscape has shifted incredibly, and in a way that I think we would never expect, because all we hear about is gridlock at both the state and the national level. But this is one issue. The drug sentencing bill passed unanimously in the House, um, and I think, it wasn't unanimous in the Senate, but I think everyone but seven people voted for it. So there's not very many things in the Minnesota legislature in the last, I would say, since 2010 that you get unanimous votes. 
But part of the reason is, and they, I, don't, I wouldn't say that the conservatives and the progressives come at it from the same way. Progressives tend to talk a lot about social justice, racial equity, but conservatives are very concerned about the cost. The, they view it as big government and another big government failure. Um, but so we have created some very unlikely partnerships on many of these issues. And in about five years ago, a group called Right on Crime formed called, and that's based in Texas. But the interesting thing is that it was founded by a group of very prominent Republicans, including Newt Gingrich, uh, the Bushes are on it. Uh, David Keene, who was the chairman of the NRA for many years, is a supporter. And so they came at it from a much more like libertarian, um, this is an intrusion into people's lives, and it's also failing. And in most states, it's the biggest portion of their budget. So they have been advocating. So I called them up one day, not thinking. I was like, well, they should come to Minnesota and help me. <laughs> Well, you'd be shocked to know they thought that I was too liberal to work with. <laughs> but I still persisted. And then one day I was reading an article in, in, in the New York Times about this group, and I see this name, and it was Mark, his name is Mark Levin. And I said, that's so weird. I went to high school with someone named Mark Levin because I went to high school in Texas. And sure enough, it was the Mark Levin I went to high school with and was on the debate team with. So I tracked down his <laughs> And I called him and I explained what I wanted him to do, and he was like, "Fine, I'll come up there." And we hosted a uh, we hosted a forum called the Conservative Case for Criminal Justice Reform, and David Keene actually came up here and spoke. And I will tell you that we got pretty great turnout from Republicans because sometimes the messenger makes a big difference. But of those people who came, I would say they have they have become diehard criminal justice. Reform. Um, and so we have some great champions on both sides of the aisle who have really believe in this and don't see it as, um, they see it as something that we need to do for the right reasons. And then I think also the other thing is, is that with the increasing amount of veterans who have been cycling in and out of the criminal justice system, there's more support for that, more support for expanding veterans courts. And I know there's sometimes pushback saying like, well, everyone should be treated that way, but sometimes I feel like if we can work, if we can demonstrate that, well, Many veterans come back with PTSD. Well, many people in the community also have PTSD. You can build the case to show that it doesn't necessarily create a greater risk to um, public safety. So I will say for me, it's been the most satisfying work I've done because it is not very often that I would find myself talking to David Keene. And um, so it's really great in this era to have that. But there's a number of things that we're going to be working on in the coming years or next year and a lot of ways you can help. And the other thing I want to say is there's a lot of things you can do at the local level, like with your city council or with your county commissioners, but um, some of the, the most important one we'll be pushing next year will be probation reform. So we've had a bill for the last two years and it's actually been chief authored by uh, Senator Chamberlain and in the Senate and Representative Zerwas. And what it would do is basically impose five-year five -year caps on probation with the exception of anyone who's committed a sex offense or <coughs> um, and so that would reduce the probation population. It would also reduce the number of people who are going into prison for technical violations. So that is probably our number one priority in the in the next year. But we'll also be working on um, a change to the veteran sentencing statute. So again, the veteran sentencing statute was passed um, about a decade ago, and what it did was allow courts to be able to consider um, factors, to consider someone's military service when they're when they're sentencing them. But we'd like to take that a step farther. California has a model bill that allows for stays of adjudication for people who are combat veterans. And stays of adjudication means you can get so you'll have a criminal record, but if you can it, during the time period while you're under supervision, if you don't make any mistakes, then that record is um, is taken away. And so we'll be pushing that. The other thing that we're very interested in is that we believe that people should be considering the impact on the children and the family. And so there is innovative new statutory language in some states that say that the judge and the prosecutor can take when they're making sentencing and um, incarceration decisions into consideration that they can look at whether or not how that would adversely impact the children. And we think that 
that should be happening anyhow. But there's a lot of innovative things going on. Another one that I think is useful, and we you might have seen there's just been a recent trend of electing progressive county attorneys, because when you're doing criminal justice reform, I like to call it the law, the law enforcement uh, triumvirate. Basically, we can't pass anything unless we get law enforcement or the corrections groups to at least a point of neutrality. And there's a lot of them, and they're very well funded. So there's the County Attorneys Association, the Sheriff's Association, the Chief's Association, then there's the Minneapolis Police and Police, I mean, then there's the MPPOA, the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers. So they have a lot of influence at the Capitol. And so the other thing is, as someone who is a criminal justice reformer, I never thought I'd spend most of my time with law enforcement. But over the years, I think that we've developed a really trusting relationship and demonstrated we can work together. But the reality is you need to work with those groups in order to pass things at the state legislature. And so that's often um, a hurdle, but um, we've been able to work around it. But the last one is I think that everyone should be pushing, and this is more of a county-wide decision, so you should tell your county commissioners, is bail. So bail is one of the, it's, it's the first way people come into the criminal justice system, and it has a big impact. So right now, you know, we use a system of bail, and it's actually written in the Constitution that you have to provide, bail has to be an option for people who are coming into jail. But it doesn't say it has to be cash bail. But the reality is if someone commits, if a poor person commits a crime and a wealthy person commits Kind of the impact is very different. A lot of poor people literally cannot afford the $500 bail. And so what happens in that day where you're stuck in jail is sometimes you lose your job and it has this ripple effect in your lives. And so we are looking at ways to go county by county and talk about changing the bail system. And we're not saying everyone should just be released, but we're saying it should be based on a neutral instrument that looks at public safety risk. Because the only reason to leave someone in jail is because they're a risk of either not returning for court or that they're a public safety risk. So those are like the big um, impending issues. And of course, we'll be continue working on voting rights um, restoration. And currently, we still have, we've always had, for the last five years, we've, had, we've actually had the votes to pass the bill in both parties. <coughs> the Senate has passed it five times now. But the House has been the hiccup. And um, even though we have a number of Republican House members who want to support it. We've had their support of the Republican Liberty Caucus and Liberty Minnesota. And so we'll be continuing to push that this year, depending on what the election looks like and the makeup of the House. But so those are some big issues. So now I'll open it up for questions. When you have a felony, um, you can't get into a lot of subsidized housing or Section 8. Mm -hmm. Can you eventually do that after you, are you on probation with felonies and then when you're off probation, then can you qualify for that kind of housing? Or is it the rest of your life? It's, well, it's, so certain section eight, it is the rest of your life and it's certain levels of crimes. Um, so yes, that's true, but it's not based on probation. Oh, okay, so meaning what? That once they're off probation, it doesn't matter. It's just what kind of felony it was. Yeah. So a bounce check that becomes a felony. It's a large amount. You have their chance. It's very, I would say, I think a bounce check you'd be fine. I'd have to go back and look. I just looked at it recently, but it's mostly drug felonies for oh, Section 8 okay. housing. But it will still impact your ability to get housing. And in fact, that's a bad one for getting any type of housing. Yeah, and yes. I'll say this, so it's another issue we want to work on, which is possibly doing like band the box for housing. Because, well, one, we have an affordable housing crisis as it is. But number two, if you can't get housing, like the whole homeless vote first model. If you can't get housing, you're not going to have a stable employment. But there just aren't a lot of places that want to rent to people. So what they end up doing is going into this like underground market where they are very often exploited and don't have the same protections as other people. So they're doing often like subleases or staying with relatives. And so it creates, it, it actually pushes people further underground than bringing them back into the community. And it's what I say about voting. When people can participate in civil society, they're more likely to follow the rules of civil society. But when they, when you're ostracized from civil society, then you don't have a lot of motivation to actually participate in a healthy, productive way. Um, if we're so concerned about recidivism, why do prisons and probation officers don't, or why can't they set up people coming out of prison a bit better with um, setting them up better for success. 
I mean, I guess my short answer is it comes down to money. Yeah. And I, I mean, so I feel a little torn because I don't want to like invest a ton in prisons, right? But the reality is we need, the one thing we need is we need mental health resources and we need substance abuse resources. And the other thing we need is we need education in the prison. Because again, remember I go back to this link where how many people who are incarcerated don't even have high school degrees? Well, first of all, everyone should be getting a GED major if you don't have one. But two, they took away a lot of the education programs that were in facilities all across the nation during the sort of 80s, 90s, tough on crime, crack epidemic, because people were saying, well, we don't, they, they've made mistakes, we don't want to invest. And the thing I hear most often is, well, we don't want to invest, like, we have trouble paying for our own college, why are we going to help, you know, someone who's in prison? But the reality is, we want to help them because they're coming back into our community, and we're going to pay for them one way or the other. We're either going to pay for them in prison or not. And just as a, as a side note, in Minnesota, it costs on average $32,000 a year to incarcerate one adult male and seventy-five dollars to $125,000 to incarcerate one juvenile per year. So we are going to pay for it one way or the other. And so the question is, is like, what is the responsibility of our corrections? And, and again, I don't want to seem like a corrections apologist, but we, I would say working with our commissioner and many of the people in the facilities, a lot of them really believe in rehabilitation, but they also don't have necessarily, aren't given the tools to do it. And the same with probation. And also, every county's probation has a slightly different feel. And there are some of the best probation officers I know who go out of their way to help their clients. But they're also facing, because we have so many people on probation, someone found 125 people on their caseload. So how can you expect anyone to do a good job? And I've interacted quite a bit with probation officers. And many of them don't even like know many of the mental health resources out there. And think about the number of people that come out that have mental health issues. I, I, I mean, this, agree. Like, we're not educating the probation officers on the resources that are out there. And so there aren't enough resources also. Yeah. Well, and I was saying, so Ramsey and Hennepin are advantaged in some ways because we do have more resources. But so now, I like to use the example, like, so let's say you committed a crime on the Iron Range and you're released there. So you're probably having trouble, you don't have access to public transportation. You probably are having trouble getting your license because you generally have to pay your fines and fees first there's not as many job opportunities, and there's far fewer services. And so when you look at recidivism from greater Minnesota, it's often worse because there are so few services offered and so few alternatives for them. And so, you know, everyone these days is talking about, is there this rural, you know, greater Minnesota, you know, divide right now? And I would say, honestly, there, this is one of the issues where I think it points that we, there are a lot of struggles that are very similar and this is one of them. Like, this is affecting everyone across Minnesota. Speaking of mental health, there's only three counties, uh, Hennepin, Ramsey, and St. Louis County, that have mental health courts. And you mentioned diversion and being the head of people having to go to jails and prisons. Are you in any coalitions? It sounds like you've got your plate full, but I would advocate for more mental health courts in more counties. Well, I totally agree with you. We need more mental health courts. So there's a few things about that. So one, yes, I think they're good. But when, when, when these specialty courts were first created or conceived, the idea was, so when you go to a specialty court for like mental health, the idea is that someone has identified that you should get some sort of special attention and would benefit from more supervision initially. So when you go, there's like mental health counselors and they check in with you. So it actually requires more work from the person who is the offender. But the idea was that in lieu of that extra work that you wouldn't end up with a permanent criminal record. And unfortunately in Minnesota we've kind of gone, so now you're asking a lot of, we're having a hard time getting people to participate in them because they're still getting a criminal record at the end. So they're saying, well I'll take the easier route, just the straight probation where I don't have to see my probation officer because why am I going to go like every week to show up in front of a judge if in fact I don't have some benefit from it. So we are working on that, and I think the place that we're first gonna start is actually with veterans courts, because we used to have great participation in these courts, and in certain counties, and every county does it a little different, they, they just aren't, people don't wanna participate right now. So we're trying to revamp some of these systems. And then the other issue is, again, it's funding. And right now, our Chief Justice has not been terribly supportive, actually, of, of specialty courts. And 
her concern is a lot of the courts get funded by grants, and she says it's not sustainable then. So unless there's like a direct appropriation from an ongoing money from the state, that there isn't always support within the counties to do them. But I think some of that will change, especially with the opioid epidemic. And a lot of people who are facing opioids, it initially starts out as a mental health issue, and then they are using opioids to compensate. So I was going to ask about drug court.